So here we're exploring some rules and properties of vectors in Rn. The first property is the zero vector, which is more of a statement than a property. The zero vector is defined as zero with the vector bar on the top. So the big thing I want you to note here, or to exercise caution with, is that the zero vector is not equal to zero. And an easy way to remember this is that zero is a scalar multiple. Right? It has no direction, it has no magnitude, it is a single point, whereas the zero vector is a vector. So another demonstration that points are different than vectors. Next, we have the unit vector, which is again more of a statement here. So we say that if the magnitude of some vector, we'll say vector u, if the magnitude of vector u is one, then vector u is a unit vector. So we'll be using unit vectors a lot this semester. It's often easier to work with a vector that has a length of one. So if the magnitude is one, then that vector is a unit vector. So next we wanna look at what are called standard unit vectors. And we'll consider two cases here. So we have the case when we're in the plane or in R2. So standard unit vectors provide us with an alternative form for the component vector form. So let's think about some vector u here in the plane with components u sub 1 and u sub 2. So in the standard unit vector form, we can rewrite this as u sub 1 times i hat plus u sub 2 times vector j hat. And this is such that i hat is the unit vector in the x direction. So that's 1, 0. And j hat is the unit vector in the y direction. So if we think about this, let's do a quick little example here. Let's say that we have the vector u defined by the components 2, 3. So an alternative way to write this vector is as 2 i hat plus 3 j hat. And plugging in those component forms for these unit vectors, we have 2 times the vector 1, 0 plus three times the vector zero, one. So to confirm the equivalence here, let's think about this graphically. So we have the y-axis and the x-axis. And if you have graphing paper, I encourage you to use it for accuracy. Otherwise, just make sure that you label and we'll try our best here. So here's our beautiful coordinate system. Now, looking at 2i hat, or 2 times the vector 1, 0, this means that from the origin, we're moving out 2 units in the x direction. So here is that vector 2i hat. Now, moving on to look at our second term, we have 3 times unit vector j, or 3 times that vector 0, 1. So that means you're moving 1, 2, 3 units in the y direction. So this is our vector three times unit vector j. Now, how are we going to find the sum of these? Well, we'll again use the parallelogram rule. This will also help us to confirm how they are equivalent. So using our parallelogram rule, we have two i hat, and we're starting at that terminal point, and now we want to add 3 j hat. So we draw that parallel vector because the position is irrelevant. So this is equivalent to 3 j hat. And then to see the sum or the component form, we start at the origin and draw the directed line segment along the main diagonal of that parallelogram. And this, if we look here, we have a component, an x component of 2 and a y component of 3 which is equal to that given vector u. So not only does this hold true in two dimensions as we've seen here, we also often use this in three dimensions. So let's look at that case real quick. So giving us a little bit more room. When we're thinking about space or R3, we know the component form of our vector is defined as 
u sub 1, u sub 2, u sub 3. And again, the standard unit vector form would be u sub 1 times i hat plus u sub 2 times j hat plus u sub 3 times k hat. And this is such that i hat, j hat, and k hat are the unit vectors in the x, y, and z direction, respectively. So that means i hat is equivalent to the vector 1, 0, 0. j hat is equivalent to the vector 0, 1, 0. And the k hat is the unit vector in the z direction, 0, 0, 1. Now, I also want you to be mindful. Here I'm, I'm giving you the vector component form, but we can also write these as column vectors. We can say that this is the column vector 1, 0, 0, that j hat is the column vector 0, 1, 0, and that k hat is the column vector 0, 0, 1. So these are the standard unit vector forms for two dimensions and three dimensions. So here's our first real property of vectors, the length of a scalar multiple. So I'm going to let C be any scalar my little heart desires, and I'm going to let vector V be any vector in Rn. So the length of a scalar multiple property then tells us that the magnitude of the scalar multiple c times vector u is equal to the scalar multiple c multiplied by the magnitude of vector u. So this provides us with an amazing shortcut, especially when we have really large components of our vector. So let's prove this. And let's look at this in three dimensions, although we know it holds true in Rn. So I'm gonna let vector u be some vector in space, such that vector u is defined by the components u sub 1, u sub 2, u sub 3. And again, we're going to let c be some scalar, any scalar your little heart desires. So some real number, some constant for this class. We're keeping it real in this class. So by definition of a scalar multiple, we know that c times vector u is equivalent to the vector c times u sub 1, c u sub 2, c u sub 3. Right, so there's our scalar multiple c times vector u. So let's take the magnitude. So I'm going to take the magnitude of this scalar multiple. So we plug this into the distance formula. So we have c times u sub 1 squared plus c times u sub 2 squared, plus c times u sub 3 squared. And if we simplify this, this leaves us with, actually let's give ourselves more room, this equals the, the big old square root here of c squared times u sub 1 squared, plus c squared times u sub 2 squared, plus c squared times u sub 3 squared. And hopefully you're getting excited here and you realize, wait a second, each term has a greatest common factor of c squared. Pull it out. Let's factor that out. So we have the square root of c squared multiplied by u sub 1 squared plus u sub 2 squared plus u sub 3 squared. And by the properties of radicals, we can now think about this as the square root of c squared multiplied by the square root of u sub 1 squared plus u sub 2 squared plus u sub 3 squared. And so the square and the square root cancel each other out on c, so we're left with just c. And notice here that we have the square root of the components or the the sum of the square of the components, which is simply equal to, by definition, the magnitude of vector u, which is what we wanted to show. Woohoo! So therefore, we have confirmed that the magnitude of a scalar multiple is equal to the scalar multiple of the magnitude. And again, this is going to be a really powerful shortcut in helping to simplify computations. If you see a scalar multiple on a vector, pull it out. 
The next property we're looking at is a unit vector in the direction of a vector v. So we say that if vector u is defined by vector v divided by the magnitude of vector v, or we can rewrite this as 1 over the magnitude of vector v times vector v, then u is a unit vector. So we know that that means that the magnitude of vector u is 1. So in other words, the magnitude of vector u is equal to 1. So this is an important property that we're often going to use, again, throughout the semester. So let's go through the proof. So to begin, we want to suppose that this holds true. So we suppose that vector u is defined as 1 over the magnitude of vector v multiplied by vector v. And this is for all vectors u and v in Rn. So if we are supposing that this holds true, then the goal here is to show that u is therefore a unit vector. So we want to show that the magnitude of this vector u must therefore be 1. Okie dokie. So with this in mind, where do we go? Well, we know that by definition of the magnitude, that the magnitude of vector v is a scalar. So 1 by the magnitude of vector v is a scalar or a constant. So let's just make a little love note to ourselves. We know that 1 over the magnitude of vector v is a real number. This is a constant or a scalar. They mean the same thing. So for the sake of simplicity, let's go ahead and let c be this scalar 1 by the magnitude of vector v. So then we can rewrite vector u, which we have previously defined as 1 by the magnitude of vector v multiplied by vector v. And we're now going to replace 1 by the magnitude of vector v with c. So we have c, our scalar, multiplied by vector v. Alrighty. Well, keeping our goal in mind here, let's go ahead now and compute the magnitude or find the length of this vector u. Let's give ourselves a little bit more room here. So we want to compute the magnitude of the vector u. So we have vector u is equal to our scalar c multiplied by vector v. So we are finding the length. So whatever we do to one side, we need to do to the other side. So we have the magnitude of vector u is equal to the magnitude of the scalar multiple c times vector v. Now, by the length of a scalar multiple property, we can go ahead and actually rewrite this by pulling that scalar multiple c out to the front. So now we have our scalar c multiplied by the magnitude of vector v. Well, since we let c be 1 by the magnitude of vector v, then we can say now that the magnitude of vector u is equal to 1 by the magnitude of vector v, right, for c multiplied by the magnitude of vector v. And would you look at this? The magnitudes cancel each other out to 1. Woohoo! And we're left with 1, which is exactly what we wanted. Since the magnitude or the length of vector u is 1, this implies that vector u is a unit vector. Hooray! So our final conclusion. So therefore, if we define vector u as being equal to vector v divided by the magnitude of vector v for all vectors u and v in Rn, 
then the magnitude of vector u is equal to 1, and therefore u is a unit vector. Hooray! And so that completes our proof.